Stefan, you are me. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm Stefan. Uh, yeah, no, that's Stefan. But I'm Stefan. I thought we're, this is Halloween. We're doing the Halloween episode, right? Uh, all right, all right. That's not for another six days. <laughs> okay, well, I'm DM Bad Wrong Fun on, on a couple social medias, but we have our amazing guest here tonight. Uh, we are I'm joined a... with... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I am Stefan Pogue. I, I, I'm an illustrator for, uh, among other clients, Goodman Games. All right, and so thank you for joining us for our special artist episode of Rules is Written. Now, we've got oh, some abnormal questions. Usually we're diving deep into the rules, uh, but this episode is going to be kind of focused on art since we have a master artist at our disposal. Um, and we'll just jump right into it. Uh, Elena, if you could bring up question one. Um, Stefan, what are the top three things a writer should know about the art that they request from an artist? Top three things they should know. Well, one of them is that any artist can only interpret the thing you wrote. They can't absolutely illustrate it. And uh, sometimes people can get kind of hung up on 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 things that um, maybe in the in the in the in the long term, they don't matter that much. Like if you you um, you've had issues before with Goodman Games, where uh, multiple artists will illustrate the same monster and they'll draw it in different ways, and that's okay. Uh, that should be okay. Um, and if you get to the point where everyone has to draw everything the same way. Um, we're kind of missing out on some of the fun, I think. Uh, so I think that would be the top, top thing to bear in mind if you are an author or wish to be an author. So when you get a commission from Goodman Games and JG says, hey, I need you to draw me this, does he give you like a, a general idea or does he give you text of what it is or does he just say... This is the, you know, go to town and create whatever you want. Uh, it, it is usually somewhere on that spectrum. Uh, so uh, often it needs to appear on a certain page in a certain space. So that kind of sets you with some parameters that you have to uh, respect uh, in order to get it to fit into the layout. And... You know, hopefully, if, if you're illustrating, for example, an adventure, you know, if it's facing a page where they're describing a climactic moment, then maybe you want to draw that climactic moment. Um, so, yes, I, I guess the, 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 to answer your question, all of the above, yes. Sometimes they tell you, I have no idea what I want you to put there. Just put something there. Uh, but more often, uh, it's uh, pretty pretty um directed subject yeah 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 directed that's a good word so yes. one of the top three things they should probably know is what size they want it because you usually get a size like you said and it says this is going to fit on this page you know put something right. in there so they should know the top size they should be open to artist interpretation um and do we have one more top three thing that they should know when they uh, request art? Well, hmm. I'll, say, I'll, I'll to... add a, a little thing. I'm curious how much in, in kind of, you say you're usually directed, well, that was my word, but but how much, you know, they're not giving you the whole, if it's a 10,000 word adventure, they're not saying, just read this section and figure out what you want to draw. They're giving you maybe some, it, it, maybe the box text or maybe bullet points like how much how much information do you normally get maybe that's a, a good one to share with folks yes and, and and that's the part that i don't think i've i've, I've expressed very well it tends to vary like usually um i work with uh, matt hildebrandt and mm -hmm. he will either tell me um 
sometimes he'll say, you know, you have the opportunity to do whatever you want. This is where it's going. So, you know, maybe this theme. Uh, and other times it's like, you know, this is an illustration of the owl bear, you know, and so it's got to be an owl bear. You can't do whatever you want. But I can figure out if I want it to look like a screech owl bear or a horned owl bear or, you know, I get to make certain decisions on my own. Um, but then to relate that back to um, asking an artist to illustrate something, if you have requirements in your artwork, be sure that you know what they are before you start. Um, because it, it can get very difficult where somebody will say, oh yeah, I, I didn't tell you this, but I wanted you to put these particular characters in the drawing. If I'm halfway done with the drawing, it's, it's not going to go very well for either one of us. You're not going to get the best picture I could make, and uh, I'm, I'm going to be frustrated. Uh, so maybe if you have directives, if you're directing the art, be sure that you, you have figured them all out ahead of time. A lot of times people sort of figure these out as they're going along. So uh, experience as an art director, maybe you need as much experience as an artist needs, you know? So people say an artist has work experience, maybe an art director needs that too, because sometimes people don't realize until after they've requested the art that um, there's some aspect of it that's very important to them that the artist might not have any idea about. Well, we apologize for the choppy sound. Steph, Stefan, your your voice is kind of chopping in and out a little bit. Uh, maybe you can wiggle the microphone cord. Uh, yeah, or, I don't know what that maybe is. Maybe just unmute and unmute. Not not sure. I will try. All right, how's that? Still a little choppy. Uh, we got a little bit of bandwidth problems going on here, people that we're trying to solve. Just bear with us. Uh, I guess maybe one of the top things they need to know is what their budget is. Are you able to work within a certain budget? Like if an artist comes to you and says, I have $100 to uh, you know get one or two pieces of art, are you able to craft something within that monetary amount? Do you say, or do you craft it first and then say, this is how much it's going to cost? It sounds like he's having hearing issues. Oh, can you hear us? I'll, I'll say, because uh, Matt and I have, have both commissioned art. Um, my, my approach has been looking at artists I like and saying, hey, what's your rate? I need something along this size. And just letting them tell me what they charge. And if it's not in the budget, I say it's not in the budget. Um, and, and say, yeah, maybe next time. Um, so not not asking them to go down, just, I and I've actually emailed uh, Stefan Pogue before saying, hey, I'd love a cover. And he was like, this is what I normally charge for a cover. And that's basically what I said. I'm like, ooh, can't, can't do it this time. Uh, may, maybe next time though. So it was a little bit more. <laughs> then I can you hear us okay? Make it happen. I I am now. Yes. Yeah, that's okay, great. Good. You sound way better. I, uh, so, well, so I hope I filled enough time. <laughs> so what was your question? About, talking about budget, uh, how how exact of a price range do they need to have to submit a request to you? Uh, in your opinion. And I I guess right now. I, I charge what I charge because I, I, I have enough work to keep me busy. Um, That's kind of what I, I was saying, which I don't are you able much to... of. I, I've just told people like, hey, what's, what's your rates for things? And I let them fully dictate that. And um, I said, I've actually emailed, emailed you once before asking about like a cover uh, art cover for something. And it was, and it was above my budget and I didn't try to, bargain you down. I just went, oh, sorry, out of, out of my budget for now. But I I know 
you're going to get enough work <laughs> that, that you're not going to miss that single thing from me. Yeah, Stefan so jumping right on. to the top of the ladder, Stefan. We got to climb our way up there, us little guys. Yeah, well, you know, you got to find out. You got to find, you, if you don't ask, you never know. It's also, it's, it's kind of, Kind of complicated to how much art should cost because there's always alternatives. Um, you know, if you can't afford uh, the the artist you want, then maybe look at uh, some people use stock art, um, and there's nothing wrong with drawing it, or having a friend draw it. I mean, that's from illustrators, you know. Um, Find some artists I don't, that are friends. I don't, down on, on, if there's a, a, a zine produced and it's got, you know, art in it, artists that I've never seen before or heard of before, to me, that's great. I mean, that's kind of part of what I enjoy most is that you know this is sort of a, a, a community where people can be kind of creative and um, work together with each other um, i gotta excuse myself for just a moment i have a i have a dog over here he's doing something bad not a problem not a problem uh, we, we can never fully control our animals they have minds of their own uh no, Stephen, my, did my i see you a game last con I saw somebody with a very similar mask at Game Hole Con in those pictures. Uh, you know, there there might have been a, a. I think he meant he meant me, not not Stefan. Stefan. Very confusing episode. Um, <laughs> you know, there there might have been someone. There were a few masks. Uh, I'll say I got mine off of Etsy. Uh, because there's I think six up for sale there, and I nabbed it, and I don't think there's any more. Very impressive. Uh, well, let's jump into our next question, Stefan. Uh, Elaine, if you could bring up question two, and yes, there is a typo. I've already noticed it. Uh, which piece of art that you created for the DCC RPG rulebook is your favorite? Do you have a favorite? Do I have a favorite? I'll say maybe not necessarily just in, in the rulebook either. Matt said that in his question, but I know it's been a while since you've drawn any of those. About a decade now, so... Yeah, yeah. It has Hard been a while. We, I, I did want to try to make some of the questions connected to the rule book, and, and we have some of the images scrolling through the, uh, the uh, Twitch stream. But do you have one that particularly stands out or that you might remember? Well, uh, there are... A, there's a couple of them that I like. I can grab one off the shelf here. Uh, one of my favorites is the giant rabbit killer guy who's, uh, you know, kung fu kicking a group of warriors and uh, leaping with an axe and a, and a sword in his hand. Uh, I like the giant rabbit man. Versions of this kind of thing. And I always enjoy things like this where where there's like a lot of stuff going on. And I remember the uh, was good. The rabbit man has been replaced in the newest CC book. I replaced it with another drawing that uh, is um, the guy uh, the cat ears hat like from a couple of years ago, and we're wearing. Yes, so he's. I don't know why he's wearing that hat, but he is. All right, well, Steph Stefan, you want to hit him up with our next question, next couple questions? Yeah, I was just trying to respond in the chat. Uh, but our, our next question is uh, what influences do you feel have had the most impact on you as an artist? And that could be. That that can be an answer you say specific artists in the past, or it can be movies or, or music that kind of impact the the moods that you write in. 
Yeah, I, I think um, when I was a kid, I, I really loved the Monster Manual, the, the first edition Monster Manual, with all the different drawings, particularly the ones by Trampier, uh, uh, and I really liked Errol Otis's work, too. Um, helped really inspire me to want to be an illustrator, but there were also uh, uh, from like uh, Hieronymus Bosch and Frank Durer and uh, Stefan Lochner. These are like dead European. Um, I, I think is I really love it, um, and more so than what you would call fantasy art. I mean, I guess they're they're technical art. Um, yeah. I don't know. I'll, I'll say I definitely feel the Bosch and the wildness of Dungeon Crawl Classics because his his work is very wild. Yeah, uh, I, I also really uh, um, 80s and 90s artwork from the workshop. And I think they actually did a better job of being role-playing games than TS did, which is kind of ironic uh, with artists like Ian Miller and uh, John Blanche and people like that. Um, like a very, I guess, sort of a more crazy style that uh, that appealed to me. We had a Shika in chat said that their favorite is the progression of the uh, corruption of the wizards. Uh, the six different posts of the progression of the corruption. Uh, but yeah, I there's think, a lot of. Good I think that was there. a Kovacs one, though. Pretty sure. Oh, was it? Was that's a Kovacs one, but it is a really, oh. it is a great it is a great drawing. I'll take credit for it. I really <laughs> like. It. Yeah, I I do have a question about one, Elena. If you could bring up SP eight, uh, I I should have wrote down what pages these are all on. But there's kind of a yeah. uh, oval image of a halfling, uh, you know, so right below they're in kind of a little uh, hovel in a little hobbit home. And it's got Lucky Lucinda, and she's got an eye patch over her eye. Is uh, is Lucky Lucinda an actual character? Say no. <laughs> um, yeah, there was a there was a character who cannot remember um, who her eye poked out. Uh, so, uh, but, but so I. I sort of thinking of her when I drew that. Um, uh, so I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, I don't remember the character's name. I just. Well, Stefan, you've got a little choppiness going on again. Do you want to try the headset one more time and see if. Uh... We're, we're going to find a sweet spot here eventually. Oh, I bet Discord wants wants him to like reset the audio connection setting or something along those lines. Stefan, do you have a particular picture that uh, is one of your favorites? Uh, let me see real quick. Among the ones I kind of love the um, I actually really love the cleric SP five. If if Alana can bring that up, it's not any particular wild piece. Um, but it's just got a, it's the, it's the one cleric he's holding his holy symbol against like a single tentacle. And I actually really love that one. Um, it is kind of simple, but it is just a great encapsulation of the cleric and the turn on holy ability. Stefan, are you back with, Stefan, are you back with us? Can you hear us? Oh, now we really messed it up. Now, now I really messed it up. Why, why don't we go, uh, we'll, be, we'll be back. Technical issues, folks. 
Welcome back, everyone. We've gotten rid of Discord, threw it out. We switched over to Zoom. Uh, hopefully, this will be a much more solid connection for everyone. Uh, Stefan, thank you for being patient with us uh, as we get these things worked out. And uh, I think we were up to question four, weren't we, Stefan? We were. And that was, um, where's the inspiration for the secret messages come from? And, uh, you know, maybe don't reveal too much. Keep it a secret. But can you tell us, like, a little bit about what they mean? You know, uh, I don't know if that's direct given to you as a directive of put in this or if you come up with those yourself. I put that second part in there. Can you tell us what it mean? Because I'm not sure I still even know what they mean. Well, <laughs> The, the the secret messages were originally suggested by Joe Goodman. Um, and Joe said to me, well, can you put a secret message in there? Just because I think it would be like, he really likes like, you know, little sort of industry insider stuff. So, you know, the idea that we're hiding messages in there and stuff like that. To Joe, that's that's a lot of fun. So, I mean, you know, that's more or less what we did. Uh, and I came up with a, um, I can't remember if it was like the sixth printing or the fifth printing. I put little, first I put little letters, you know, just kind of stuck them different places. And then if you went through the books and found all the different letters, uh, and then found that there was like a key to the letters and translated them, you could read the message. And it was just like a, 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 a silly little message that basically said, have you found this message? Kind of, uh, I don't remember exactly what it said, but it said something like that. And then since then we've kept refining it, making it more complicated. But unfortunately at this point, everybody knows to look for the message. So, it's less of a secret thing and more of a an activity. And the last time we did it, like they released the PDF. And I think within 48 hours, somebody had cracked the code already. Uh, so. Well, I haven't. <laughs> I, I think I've got most of them. Like some of them, I'm not sure. There's a total of nine secret messages or 10 secret messages. Is that right? Or nine? I I am not sure because I may not be responsible for all the secret I, messages. I thought there was only three or four because there's not a new one in every printing. It's only because it's like, oh, this is the second printing. But like it was only after x number of printings that the art got an update because you have to update the art because they're hidden in the art that gets replaced all right yes so, yeah. I think the, the first secret message was after we had revised uh it was like the the fourth or fifth printing i don't i don't know that was the first secret message and so then but there are also other secret messages that are not secret messages, like they're just kind of in there, but there's no, so I don't know whether to tell you those are secret messages or not. Um, probably they are, but, but for example, there are secret messages in there that say things like, you know, Stefan Pogue drew this, you know, which is kind of stupid, but it's I funny. I think I've spotted that it. one. <laughs> All right. So. Um, Elena, if you can bring up SP52, uh, this is the image that's in the back of the book with the kind of devil figure, and it's got the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, and then it says, get a clue underneath the devil face, and then it says, have you found this, the hidden message? So this is kind of the cipher that anyone new uh, needs to look at. They need to, they need to figure out where this message in the back relates to. Um, I, I mean, I think everyone kind of knows, and if they don't, should should we tell them? Well, no. I can't. I'm not going to tell them. You can tell them. I I wouldn't even know what to tell them. Um, uh, no, I mean, you know, it's 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 maybe it's a fun treasure hunt for people online. We we won't tell them what the cipher text goes to. I won't tell them the second image, but Stefan, I've found at least nine 
So Elena, if you could bring up, let's see, where's number one at? Uh, let's bring up SP uh, 10 and, or SP, yeah, SP 10. And this is code number seven because there's a Roman numeral attached to each secret message, right, Stefan? In this particular secret message, yes. And I think that's the one that came in the eighth printing. I think that's right. Oh, what if there's, yeah, I didn't even think of that. So what if there's a I'll say it was, um, if if you need some help updating the next one, I don't know if the order of the letters has anything to do with it, but you use the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog because that has, I think it, it has, well, if you get rid of the first D, if it's just quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog, it has one letter in the alphabet and only one letter of each letter. But uh, what do they suit it with the much cooler version, Sphinx of Black Quartz, Judge My Vow. Is it? Is it a what is it called, Stefan? A tanagram? Is that what it's called? <laughs> uh, that's another thing I don't know. I, I don't know. Like I I first encountered that phrase in like in in art school. I had to take a typography class. And so there were a lot of like, you know, oh, this is, you know, the the the, the old English font, you know, and they would show it to you and they'd write that sentence out. To show you what each letter looked like. Okay. Um, so that that's where I first encountered that. I like your your one better about the Sphinx. Um, yeah. Wow. Maybe a little black more course, appropriate. Judge my vow. I I've associated each of the room and numerals as a secret message. So if we can bring up SP eleven, that has code number four on it, and it's written on a serrated sword. Uh, it looks like they're kind of in a uh, cavern of some sort. And then SP15 has code number two. It's got the Roman number two on the little uh, lizard guy with a wizard over a pot. And then right underneath as he's contemplating his orb is a message written on the table. And then let's see, where do we got some more of them? Uh, if we bring up SP34, that is code number eight. Because uh, you got the eight right on the back of his collar. And this one has a question mark on the end of it. And then SP32, that's going to be a little thin one. Uh, and right underneath, it's got the nine in the bottom left corner of the book, the I and the X. That's why I think this is going to be the longest secret message, if it is a secret message. But I think it is. It is. It is a longer secret message. And then SP44 is code number five. Uh, and she's holding a scroll with a message on it. And you have the five on her belt. Uh, so that's where that one was kind of sneaky. And then image SP45 has code number six. And it's on the back of his head, his hat, as he's looking in the mirror. And it's written across his face or across the top brim of his hat. Uh, with a warrior holding a glowing sword. Now, the one I wasn't sure of, I found all nine, but it, Elena, if you could bring up SP40, this looks like it might be a priest of, Stefan, how do you say it? Bababagabills. Bababagabills. Put your, put your thumb in, in your mouth against the corner <laughs> of the inside and go, Bababagabills. And, and that's, yeah. that's the froggy way to say it. You gotta, you gotta say it like you have a mouthful of swamp water. Yeah. Um, now so they, it this is looks like a cleric of a bugbills, but it's a whole book of text with similar messages to secret letters. It doesn't. Okay, this have this one I will reveal for you. All right. Okay. Right? This one is. It just says like three or four times. It says this is not the secret message you are looking for. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, that, okay. that's actually not scoop. part of it. It's just, <laughs> that's just uh, like, I guess it is a secret message, but it's not the one you're looking for. So that is secret message number 10, unofficial secret message number 10. Um, 
Yeah. And so do you have any more secret messages that do you do anything secret and whenever you're drawing, like I was, I watched a, a seminar from, um, I think it was Alyssa Faden. And she said, I always put a little thing in my maps that the writer hasn't included. And I've started doing that as well. Like Stefan, your dragon peak map, there's yeah. a, there's a little kind of building over by the uh, side. I think it's like a campfire that I drew in your forest. I snuck that in there. Uh, but she said, I always put something secret in there because the players are going to notice. and They're going to be like, what's this for the uh, judge or whoever's running the game <laughs> to build off on? Uh, do, you, do you ever do that at all, Stefan? Uh, yes. Yeah, and sometimes, sometimes I, I take it back out. Like a while ago, I was working on a map for somebody and I thought I was being really clever and I put a, a, a message which may not may or may not have included an obscenity in <laughs> the map and and then I realized that like I, I'm working on it you know this big then I realized when you shrink it down to this big suddenly it's just like just the word what it's just like right there <laughs> so i had to i had to take it out um but sorry joseph no that wasn't that wasn't on a joseph project <laughs> i gotta uh, keep it clean for joseph that was for somebody else well, uh, Sky Two <laughs> has found out that the uh, the quick brown fox is called a pangram. Uh, so a I knew pangram. Pangram. Okay. But I've never heard the one you said, Stefan, either. So that's a that's another cool pangram. Uh, our next question, Elena, if you can bring up question five, uh, Stefan, have you created a work that you consider your magnum opus, your your greatest creation to date? Or, or perhaps your most recent proudness, because your magnum opus is ahead of you. Yeah. Um... <laughs> well, you can you can have a magnum opus now, and then have another one a year from now. And replace the old one. That's true. You know, I mean, I don't want to be somebody who peaks too early, uh, but I guess given my age, it's too late for that. I don't have to worry about peaking early. Um. I I really like the um, illustration work that we did, and I say we as the the all of the artists who work on Goodman Games stuff. I think we did a really great job on Mutant Crawl Classics, and I really like the latest edition of the DCC rules. I think I I did a very good job on that. I think those are the two things that I am most proud of. Yeah. Do you keep works of art in your house? Like, do you keep favorite works of art framed on up on your walls or you've got enough of it that you don't want to look at it every day? Um, I, 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 uh, I try to keep things that I think will help inspire me. So uh, I have, if you know the the Empire of the East book that uh, Goodman published, I printed out the cover of that, uh, which is by Ian Miller, uh, just to look at. Uh, and I have that hanging uh, above my drawing table, along with um, a couple of other things. Some of them are just sort of reference things like you know, drawings of skeletons and things like that, just, just to kind of, sometimes you just want to see how the bone is shaped or something like that. Um, yeah, that's mostly what I do. I mean, I, I, I think I look at, I look at art a lot when I'm not drawing, but when I'm drawing, I'm usually too busy to look at art, if that makes sense. Um, it does. I, I have a side question. I don't remember who it was, but I remember seeing another artist talk about drawing skeletons. And what they said was, with skeletons, you can cheat a lot. Because people don't really, I mean, you can look up pictures of skeletons. You can look up anatomical drawings. 
with the average person, if you draw a skeleton weird, they're not going to notice you didn't include a bunch of bones. Yeah. <laughs> what, what, I don't know if you have a comment on that. No, I think, I think that's, I think that's legit. I mean, you know, you, you, you know what they're trying to draw, kind of. Um, I mean, I'll, skeletons are funny, too, because we never see them until the creature has fallen apart, you know? So, like, you're... The skeleton won't hold together. Um, it's without, all magic, anyway, yeah. Yeah, I mean, together. without without like muscles and tendons and stuff, it it's just it's going to be a pile of bones. Uh, so I think it's acceptable to to maybe cheat a little bit, and I don't think I ever put in the correct number of ribs. Uh, <laughs> you know, sometimes I put in like six on each side, and sometimes more than that. I. I'm I'm relatively certain. I think there are like twelve on each side. So, yeah. Well, I, speaking I of, speaking of weird cheating or, or maybe not cheating, but what's uh what's some the best advice you've ever uh been given by someone else about being an artist, or or maybe just the best advice that you think you can give out about being an artist? The best advice would. I don't know. I think that when I think that when I was in school, I wish I had paid more attention to um, my drawing teachers, who I, I I thought I knew better than them, and I think it it made my it still follows me now. Pay attention in school, kids. That would be my advice. Is there a particular piece of advice that you've gotten from someone that you recall that you uh, remember? I mean, maybe maybe it was just another artist you're hanging out with at a convention, and they said something, and you're like, "Oh man, that's that." But pay attention at school is good too. <laughs> yeah, um, I think actually. What the, the the thing that I saw an artist do, uh, this I'm not very comfortable with people all the time. Like sometimes I have some social anxiety or something like that. But I remember being at Gen Con and seeing uh, Tony De Tierlizzi talking to people. And he was just talking to whoever came up to his booth. And he was like so engaged with them and so generous, you know, because he he doesn't need these people, right? He's he's a actually kind of moved beyond illustrating RPGs and into book illustration. He's he's kind of in another category, a higher category than than an RPG illustrator. So he doesn't need these people, but he's he was really spending a lot of time with people and looking at their portfolios and stuff. And I thought that was really cool. I thought that that was the right way to do it. Like if if I wanted to be more like someone, I would want to be more like him in that moment. And, and, and I'll say, because I, I don't, uh, I've seen people come across. Uh, you probably don't mean moved beyond RPG in some kind of derogatory way. Just because I know it, it is, uh, it, you're probably talking about it more of a pay scale thing yeah. because <laughs> our people who do RPGs and focus on that, they're probably doing it because they love this specific hobby. Uh, yeah, yeah. You could probably find things that pay a little bit better, normal book illustrations, if you really wanted to. Yes. Yes, right. yes. Thank you for the clarification. I, I didn't mean to say that I thought he thought he was above it. I he just he's got better paying gigs now. Kinda yeah, yeah, exactly. Pay it forward to the uh, the artists coming up uh, beneath you uh, is kind of the idea. Yeah. I, I, well, and also you know just you know maybe to me he seemed like a really good human being, and maybe that. Maybe sometimes I wish I could be a better human being. So, 
is that that is an excellent thing to aspire to for for all of us no matter how good we might think ourselves um that seems like a, a good place to end on that question i don't think we can get any better than that answer be a better human being uh so for the the next one um it's a uh, question 77 not just seven uh, but you've also created a few comics uh such as Never Trust a Wizard in the Cube. I've read those in the Hobonomicon issues. Uh, do you have any plans for future comics, maybe? I have... Um, I, I, I do have, like, vague plans. Unfortunately, I don't have specific plans. Uh, so I think it would be better if I did make some specific plans. I think that's something, something for me to do. I the the, the pandemic um, has been a little rough on me. I had COVID pretty bad, uh, and I think that slowed me down a lot. Um, like two years ago, I I I have a I had a sister that had it about two years ago, and she's still slower than she was. So yeah, yeah not alone. The the long COVID is is some real stuff. Yeah, so um, I'm, uh, yes, I would like to do more. I, I did a couple of uh, different sort of horror comics, uh, like uh, uh, Dagon, which is the Lovecraft story, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 Clark Ashton Smith's uh, Mother of Toads, and things like that. I'd like to do another one of those. Um, I just don't know when. Like right now, I'm working on some maps for an as of yet unannounced Goodman project uh, that uh, I think it, people are people are going to be pretty excited when Joe finally announces it. Um, so it sounds like a, a maybe you can say is it a a big project? Uh, yeah, it is a big project. Okay. It is a big project. It may have already been announced. I I, I might just be <laughs> pissing in the wind here, uh, but but um, I don't think it has been. Uh, maybe it has. I'm gonna just say it's uh, uh Janelle Jackway's uh, Dark Tower. Uh, oh yeah yeah. I'm going to reprint. That's... I think they announced it. They've announced that one. Okay. All right. Okay. But but good to see that we're gonna get some more amazing maps from you on that project. Uh, the, the maps are really complicated, so... It, um, they always tend to be. <laughs> so I, I, I'm kind of struggling with that right now, um, but uh, I'm hoping to do some more just straight-up illustration work, too. Um, I mean, maps the, are necessary, but for me, they're not the most exciting. Uh, maybe the initial, you know, inventing the map, I always find that part fun. But when you're, you know, drawing it and trying to make sure you get the right number of squares, you know, in each room, that, that part is, it's a little hard. A little is, is it, uh, that that makes me curious about another thing. Uh, you said you prefer illustrations, you prefer, you know, black and white illustrations. I'm, I'm sure you can get them done a lot quicker, but you also do plenty of like gorgeous cover arts and, you know, color images. Um, yeah, I, I, I guess like, Probably seventy percent of my work is black and white, and I I, I really like it. Uh, I've been working a lot more with shades of gray lately, you know. Uh, and I kind of switch I switch off. Like sometimes I'll do everything. It's either black, white, and I really enjoy doing like little hatch marks. Um, and then sometimes I use a lot more tone. And there's there's no real reason why I go back and forth. I just, I just do. Well, Stefan, we like to ask our guests the previous week's questions, and you have an illustration that kind of applies to one of them. Elena, if you could bring up SP-46. Um, SP-46 is a, a thief or an assassin, and he's standing on the beams above a, a portly fellow merchant, maybe, sitting in a plush chair and he's got kind of like a, a fist dagger in one hand and a wavy kind of poison dagger in the other hand 
and he's standing on the beams in the top of the room while there's a dancer in the middle with a tambourine and two guards inside. Um, one of our questions two weeks ago, last session, was if a thief has two weapons and they have the agility for it, would you allow a backstab with both of those weapons? So if this thief drops down from the rafters, would you allow or, you know, would you try to hit with both weapons? Would you allow that if they have two actions? Absolutely. That's what I like to hear. You know, I mean, sure. I mean, you know, it's conceivable to me that it might not be the best way to do it, but <laughs> it's a way to do it. Uh, Stefan, we should have used that piece of art for that question. That would have been yeah, we should have. We should have. We are smarter than than we are. We yeah. would. Uh, one of our our other questions from two weeks ago uh, with Bob Brinkman is: Are there any rules for assisting others in ability checks? Do you have any? Uh, you you play DCC. What rules do you guys use at your table for if you wanted to assist someone else with a check, like three people lifting a door, pushing a door open? Yeah, I mean. Usually, I think it's got to be something where everyone, like, there's something they can do. Um, this is this is my. I, I don't usually serve as the judge, but this is sort of my my conception of it. Usually, there's got to be something that somebody can do. So, if if it's you know something tiny where somebody else can't help you push on it or pull on it, then, you know, I, I don't know. It's like... Let's say they were holding a bucket of rocks over a well, and one person's on the rope, and they're trying to prevent it from crashing down, and other people can run up and grab on the rope. What uh, what modifiers or what... Uh, what Dice assistant? chain or plus this is and that's... Yeah, probably... Yeah, that's more of a judge question. If I were the judge, I would probably uh, either give them a plus two or just bump them up the dice chain uh, for each person adding. I mean, you know, I mean, if you have, I don't know, like if somebody's like a, a pixie, you know, they can't really <laughs> pull on the rope, um, but maybe they could fly up under the bucket and and push up i don't know. okay uh, yeah no no that's fun <laughs> I like that. well we're we're at about the end of our our time we had um i know you you've got your website you know stephanpoe.com i just put it in the chat uh is there any other place people you might want people to find you or or should just look at your work i don't i I'm not an Instagram guy, but I don't know if you do Instagram or, or something like that where people can, you know, see all, get the sneak peek at the latest thing you've been drawing. Yes, I, I used to do Instagram and for like the past two weeks, I have not. And that's only because I just, I've not been in the mood, uh, but I'm coming back, I promise. I get it. <laughs> I'm coming back. I, I it's It's nothing personal. It's just... I'm going their through, internet it's i'm going it's, through a, a, a social media rough patch so if they wanted to buy some of your work uh where would they go stephanpogue.com uh there, there are a few pieces listed on the website or there were i think i i took them down but they can actually people can just uh, contact me through my website and ask me if i have it and if i can find it uh they can buy it and the real problem is finding it. Are you headed to any cons in the upcoming future? I have not been doing cons lately because of my, my COVID problem. Um, I would like to change that. I, 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 I was going to con, I would, I would go to Gary Con and Gen Con up until COVID. And after mm -hmm. that, I've, um, I just haven't felt up to it. I, yeah. I seem to remember you were you had a booth in um in Gethertown at the last Cyclops Con, I think. Am I remembering that right? There was a whole yes. lot of artists. So yes. okay. So at, at very least if people can kind of find you in that setting, prob yeah. probably at the next one. I know that's we, like yeah, six we, months out or something. So no promises, folks. But another, another Gathertown coming up next year. Yes. 
Uh, well, is there anything else you'd like to promote, Stefan? Uh, anything else you got going on? Any secrets you can let us in on? I I do not have any secrets. Um, you see me and Stefan both smile devilish, devilishly. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't. Uh, uh, no, right now I am. I am. Uh, I am working on those maps and those are not very secret. So no, I would like to do more um, hidden messages in the future. Uh, and I would like to sneak in more little secret details. All right, I, I've got a project you might enjoy that. I, I've got an idea for some secrets. Uh, so I'll be getting in touch. Okay. Uh, uh, we want to thank you very much for coming on tonight. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching at home. Um, it was a pleasure having you on, and we hope to see you again in the future, Stefan. Thank you so much. Uh, it's an absolute blast to meet another one of, you know, there's there's not that many people out here who have as good of a name as you and I, so it's always good <laughs> to meet another. Uh, Stefan, not Stefan. You got anything coming up, <laughs> No, uh, I've been posting on a few things. I'm I'm planning a a Kickstarter thing for some various Elfland themed things next year, and I just got a I'll, I'll another artist, uh, Bruno Prozeko is B Prozeko. I'll I'll try to post in the chat. You'll find him on Twitter. He's posting stuff recently. He's a great artist too. He, he's from Brazil, and I just got some cover art back from him, and absolutely love it. So that that's not, nothing super soon for me, but. He's great, okay. and uh, he, he takes commissions, too. So, All right. Well, I've got the uh, Reaver Express coming up on Friday, and I've scheduled a game, and I think you have his game scheduled as well for role-playing game Alliance Con. Uh, and it's do, to actually. help some uh, charities. Uh, some It's from our friends up north in Canada. They put this con online every uh, year. This is the fifth one, I believe. Um, so you can find out more in the Discord channel or at Role Playing Game Alliance. Uh, uh, they also have a Facebook page, but there's going to be some DCC going on there. And I've submitted my game for be a play test. So you know, now that I'm play testing it, I'm going to have to print it. So it's yeah. it's what uh, the House of Entridar. Entridar. Uh, so yeah, it's gonna be a, it's gonna be a, you might recognize it from the Reaver Express. It came together really Ooh. nice, but they only got through a couple rooms. So I was like, well, I already created all this content. Uh, I'll just put it out as a little funnel. <laughs> uh, but that's gonna be it for us, folks. Elena, thanks again for the awesome uh, stream management, and y'all have a great night. We'll see you in two weeks. Oh wait, let me find out who our guest is gonna be. Uh, two weeks. Let me look at my schedule real quick. Uh, is, it I know Harley? We, is it Jen? Who do we, we got? Get? Jen Brinkman coming up. We've got Harley Stroh coming up. Uh, let's see here. Two weeks time on. Where is it? All right, I'm right there. In two weeks time, um, Harley Stroh, November eighth. Uh, Harley Stroh Ooh. is going to be on, and then November twenty second, it's going to be Jen Brinkman. Uh, and then December 6th, Bob Brinkman. So tune in for those three episodes. We'll see you then. Yep. We're going to be asking Purple Planet questions for Harley. So y'all keep tuned. Well, we're going to hit Harley hard with the questions. <laughs> he's got a lot to, he's got a lot to answer for. All right, All everybody. Right. Thanks.